a lot of 3D artists tend to forget one major thing when creating their models, and it's the difference between something very CG looking versus something that feels right and real. You can see it in action here, and in this shot too, or even in this one. But what is it? And if you mastered this modeling technique, which isn't easy to do at all, you'll level up any model you make. Now, a lot of people slap on a bevel modifier and call it a day, but besides the countless issues you can run into, doing this is actually unrealistic. So in this video, I'll show you how to really use bevels to get great looking, portfolio-ready models. Before we do that though, it's important to understand why we use bevels in modeling. It's not because modeling programs require them. In fact, programs like Blender are unique in a sense that they can actually actually create a connection between phases that comes to a perfect edge, which is not possible in the real world. If we could do this in the real world, however, we would effectively have something so sharp it could cut through anything, probably even through atoms itself, and who knows what that would do. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that nothing in the real world, no matter how sharp it may seem to the eye, is ever a straight edge. Everything has a bevel, and that's just a technical limitation of, well, physics. And this also means that, as with anything centered around realism, achieving the best result comes down to mimicking what our eyes and brain are used to seeing day in and day out, which are edges that properly catch light, show thickness, define shape, and give weight to a model. Or beveled edges. So that brings us back to taking a model, slapping on a bevel modifier, and calling wow. it quits, right? Wrong. Wrong. But let's get into why that is. So I've said it a couple times now that the bevel modifier is no good, but that's not entirely true. The bevel modifier is amazing for what it does, beveling every sharp edge on a model. Now, if you're unsure what a sharp edge is, you can go up here and click on select and use this function to find every sharp edge on your model, which are all the edges that will be beveled with the bevel modifier. On real objects, however, not every edge is beveled equally. Some edges are beveled because they have to be due to production limitations. Others are seemingly sharp, but are still beveled when zoomed in greatly. And other times objects have different bevels because of design choices. The bevel modifier in Blender bevels every edge that exceeds a certain angle. This angle is 30 degrees by default and can be changed here. The higher the value, the more edges are excluded from the effect and the lower, the more are included. For example, this icosphere is untouched by the standard bevel settings. But if I lower this angle value here, at 15 for example, it starts beveling all of the edges. And on this object here, you can see the differences that happen once I lower or increase the value. All right, so on one hand, the bevel modifier simply bevels all edges above a certain angle threshold. But what if you want multiple edges with different bevel values, or you maybe want to exclude certain edges, which is sort of the standard for real life objects? The modifier does have some form of a solution to that. By changing the limit method from angle to weight, you can use something called edge data Data to drive the modifier. If you then select an edge, open up the item tab with N and change the mean bevel weight for the edge in the edge data, you can control how much that edge is affected by the modifier. This can be a relatively flexible way of getting bevels on models in the right places and having various bevel amounts across your object. This also makes sense for, for example, a glass window where the edges from frame to glass shouldn't be beveled because they're two separate objects in the real world. It also pairs up nicely with subdivision surface based hard surface modeling and can be a good solution for simpler hard surface objects. And that's why it's also what I teach in my own course over on CG Cookie, for example. And while we're on the subject of courses, this video sponsor, Skillshare, is an amazing place to learn all about Blender modeling. With over 700 quality Blender courses aimed at every skill level from complete beginner to advanced, it's easy to learn on Skillshare. Skillshare is the largest learning community for creatives and probably the biggest resource of Blender courses out there, including courses led by industry professionals such as Derek Elliott and Alden Peters. For example, Alden here has five courses, part of his learning path, Blender for filmmakers and production designers, Elevate Your Scenes and Lighting that will teach you all about using Blender for filmmaking, compositing, lighting, and atmospheric effects taught by a professional filmmaker and VFX artist. Which is awesome because Skillshare has content on so many topics that overlap with creatives' interests such as animation, design, entrepreneurship, or even music. Learning some or all of these skills will not only improve your Blender art, but also enables you to get better clients, ask for better rates, or find better jobs based on your multi-skilled portfolio. With summer breaks and slow-paced work environments around the corner, honestly, now is the perfect time to start learning. And to make that even easier to do, the first 500 people to use my link in the description receive a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Okay, so back to bevels. 
Like I said, the weight method can be a great fix for certain objects. However, even for slightly complex objects with different parts or edges, this method can be a pain in the butt. This is because the bevel modifier breaks if the topology is no good, if there's not enough room on a model to fit in a bevel, and if using the weight method is impossible because you need a lot of different weight types. It also leaves very little freedom to control your topology since the modifier will automatically be applied when exporting the object to, for example, a game engine, and there's no real way of controlling its values precisely on a model. So how then do you do proper bevels? Well, simply with some good old fashioned elbow grease manually. By selecting an edge and pressing Ctrl B, we can add in a manual bevel in Blender. Or we can select a vertex and press Shift Ctrl B instead to bevel a vertex. After beginning the bevel, we can control quite a few settings. Down here at the very bottom of the Blender interface, you can see which shortcuts will give you access to what features of the bevel tool. However, I find it messy to look at and hard to remember which shortcuts do what most of the time. Instead, I find it a lot easier to use the bevel menu down below here, which contains all of these settings too. The first, since this menu is non-destructive until we close it, is choosing whether the bevel is an edge or vertex bevel. Now, if you use the right shortcut, this should always be set correctly to your intentions, of course, but you could still switch it if you wanted to. Next is the bevel width type, which is set to offset by default, and I've personally never changed that ever. But if any pro models prefer other types, do let me know in the comments and why you use them. Next is the width, controlling the overall size of the bevel. Then we have the segments, letting you choose how smooth or segmented the bevel needs to be. The shape, choosing between completely concave or convex, with 0.5 being a perfectly rounded bevel and also the default. The material index, for if you automatically want to apply a different material to a bevel. Hardened normals, which matches the normals to adjacent faces. Clamp overlap, which prevents prevents overlapping phases when using too high width values. Loop slide, which is on by default and controls Blender preferring sliding edges, which are edges that take into consideration the adjacent edge shape versus even width edges, which are a more spaced out version. Marking bevels automatically as seams for UV unwrapping or sharp for shading. Miter settings for the inside and outside, which are actually really important, but we'll get into that more later. Intersection type for, well, whatever this is, base strength. Yes. The profile type, which lets you use custom bevel profiles versus the standard super ellipse. For example, this is a great way to create stairs. Very easy, very convenient to do. Let's dive a little deeper into the ones that really matter to improve your models. First of all, the max amount of bevel or the width you can add on an edge or vertex is always the amount needed to have the newly formed edges overlap with other pre-existing edges. Whoa. <laughs> that sounds kind of complex, but if I show you what I mean on this cube, it kind of explains itself and it's actually quite simple. The maximum amount of bevel I can add is when the new edges, these two, overlap with the previous edges or the existing edges, which are these two. Segments, however, are a different till. Most beginners like to crank this up real high, but if you're using a subdivision surface modifier, there really is no reason to do so since that will do most of the heavy lifting anyways. I recommend always using an even number of segments like two, four, or if you really need it, six. This way you can easily remove edges by simply selecting an edge loop and pressing Ctrl X to dissolve it. This allows for easy creation of low poly versions of your high poly beveled models. For non-hero game assets, you can even get away by only using one segment, also known as a camfer, and combining this with a weighted normal modifier. This way you get a smooth look, especially from further away, at the cost of practically no additional geometry at all. And the final setting that's important is the miter, which is formed when two beveled edges meet at an angle. There's an inner miter for angles less than 180 degrees and an outer miter for more than 180 degrees. In this example, you can clearly see a difference in using the different miter types for both the inner and outer miter. I personally like using the arc type for outer miters and then the sharp one for inner miters, but it's kind of dependent on your model and the resulting geometry and shading look after you've applied the bevel to see which type of miter works for you. Okay, so that's all fun and games, and as you can see, there's quite a lot to using bevels, so let's take a practical example and not just use blobs and cubes. Here's a relatively complex hard surface model that I made based on my drinking cup lid. It's low poly and it has pretty decent topology all around and is a great base for a subdivision surface modifier to get that nice high poly hard surface look. 
It looks nice and smooth, but it loses all its form, which is why we need bevels. So here's a version with a bevel and a subdivision surface modifier slept on with two segments. As you can see, it's not terrible, but we have little to no control over the amount since there's a lot of different geometry with various possible sizes. It also breaks with basically any value since the bigger sizes won't fit in the smaller areas, resulting in very sharp bevels everywhere. Now, I'm using two segments for this, but you could use more like four for example. But since I'm using the subdivision surface modifier already, adding additional geometry is not necessary and in my opinion looks worse than just using two. This is a personal choice though and should always be something to look at for your own models in your own circumstances. However, do take into consideration that using more segments comes at the cost of adding in more geometry, which can quickly ramp up if you use more than two or four segments for a bevel, as you can see in the numbers on screen now. Anyways, let's compare this version to a manually beveled one. With this edge here all around the top of our model, let's add a big bevel with only two segments because we don't need more because of our subdivision service modifier. Let's make sure clamp overlap is enabled so we don't get any of the weird shading here. Next we have this edge here around our drinking lip and we're going to give this a relatively large but still quite small bevel. Now let's select the outer rim at the top here, give it a larger bevel and the inner rim and give that a small bevel. Now we can select the edge going around here, making sure we include these edges as well. Select these two as well and give them another small two segment bevel. The large edge around here gets a larger bevel so we get a nice smooth look. With all the edges at the back part here selected, let's add another very small bevel and make sure to use the proper miter. Now I'm going to use the outer miter type of arc just because this will result in a smoother look when applying the subdivision service modifier, but you can get away with using the sharp version as well. Now let's select all of the edges on this thing here and we can finalize our model. Let's once more apply a very small bevel like so. And in this case, I am going to use the sharp outer miter just so we can maintain proper quad topology for all the parts around here. And here's the final version with the manual bevels applied. And if we put that side by side with a simple bevel modifier version, like I've shown before, you can tell the manually beveled part looks much more natural and generally has a better way to it. Simply put, it feels more real, which in terms of portfolio pieces is always a good thing. And so now you know how to really do bevels in Blender by hand. But that great looking model could use a proper light setup, don't you think? So make sure to check out this video in which I'll show you everything you need to create better lighting in Blender.